Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another outstanding Authors at Google Talk. Um, today, we're thrilled to host um, Jeff Ma. And um, Jeff is one of the legendary members of the MIT Blackjack team, uh, w w which is a group of students and affiliates whose study of statistics became legend and is the subject of movies such as um, 21 and the book Bringing Down the House. Um, success in gambling is very similar to success in life and in business. It's all about making the right decisions with the right amount of luck. And so it's no question that the, the years that Jeff has spent honing his blackjack skills at MIT have given him a basic strategy for success in the, the VC world here in the Silicon Valley. So he'll be talking to us today about his most recent book, which is entitled The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business. We'll have some mics at the end for, for questions and answers. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jeff to Google. Thank you. So thanks for having me, guys. Um, how many of you guys have seen 21? Pretty good amount of people. So you know that the greatest bit of Hollywood magic is how they turn an average looking Asian American male into a dashing British white guy, <laughs> which is what they did. So I was the uh, main. The inspiration for the real life uh, character that Jim Sturgis played in the movie 21 and, and the character Kevin Lewis in the book Bring Down the House. And um, I always like to tell a, a couple stories when I get started about um, my days uh, card counting that weren't in the book and, and aren't in either of my books. So, you know, Bring Down the House was the first book, and uh, The House Advantage, which is over there, is, is, is my new book. But I like to tell these stories about. Uh, playing blackjack with celebrities, which was a lot of fun. I have some good stories with all these guys. And, and my, my favorite story actually comes from the opening night of the Bellagio. I had the pleasure of playing blackjack with Kevin Costner. And Kevin was there with his group of friends. Now, what's kind of interesting about the opening of any casino, there's always uh, three types of people there. There's uh, card counters like myself, because for us, that was like our emerging markets. You know, like this is like this new casino opening up. They're much more worried about... Um, paying people correctly than they are about catching card counters. And the second type of people are celebrities. And anyone guess the third type of person? Card counter, celebrities, you're at a casino. What's that? Just yell it out loud. Gold digger, cougars, close. You can tell a lot about an audience by how quickly they get this. I was in a real estate conference in, um, in Orange County, and I asked this question. And no sooner were the words out of my mouth than a woman from the back row screams, hookers! So it's card counters, celebrities, and prostitutes. And what's funny is when you do this type of corporate event type stuff, whenever the person who gets it yells it out, I always make them stand up, and then that's what's called a career limiting maneuver. So, um, but anyway, so I'm at the Bellagio opening night and have the pleasure of playing blackjack with Kevin Costner. And he has his group of friends with him, and it's Kevin Costner. So if it were a rapper, it would have been like his posse. But since it's Kevin, it's just his group of goofy friends. And every hand, uh, he was a good player, meaning he did the right thing most of the time. And then he started to lose. And every hand he lost, his friends would look at me and say, God, this is like Waterworld all over again. <laughs> so Actually, I'll, I'll tell one other story just because, just because it's a good story and because you guys are here for entertainment. And if you want the real hard business takeaway, you can get the book. But it's not really, it's, very, it's a very entertaining book, I think, too. Um, one of the funnier stories also has to come, comes from the uh, NBA lockout. So we may be headed for another NBA lockout in a couple years, but the last NBA lockout was about 10 years ago. And where do you think NBA players went when they couldn't? Um, they went to casinos. And so I had the pleasure of playing blackjack with a bunch of the Nick, uh, Knicks, John Starks, Patrick Ewing. So I sit down at the table with John Starks, and John is, you know, goes, nice guy, drinking Merlot, which I thought was really weird. For, you know, we're, we're all from the Bay Area, so we drink wine, we love wine. But for an NBA, big, burly NBA player at the casino drinking wine, it just seemed like a little weird to me. Actually, it's not that weird, because now I kind of have this whole new impression of what NBA players drink. I was in uh, Vegas about two years ago playing, black, uh, playing craps, because I'm not allowed to play blackjack anymore. And uh, Jalen Rose, who played in the NBA for about 56 different teams, comes up to me. And we start talking. And it turns out that the two of us had a lot of common friends, because he was trying to get into sports media. And I was in sports media at the time. And he finally says to me, Jeff, let's grab a drink together. And I said, OK, Jalen, what do you want to drink? And he says, whatever you want to drink. And so I have one, you know, being a data-driven guy, I have one data point. And that is that John Starks drinks Merlot. 
So I'm like, I wonder what NBA players drink. He goes, whatever you want to drink, just order it. So now I have rap videos, visions of rap videos going through my head. And I turn to the waitress and I say, give us two glasses of Cavassier. <laughs> I don't even know what Cavassier is. So the waitress starts to walk away. And Jalen Rose, who has like nine foot long arms, grabs her and goes, excuse me, ma'am. Could you make mine an apple martini? So he's like 6'9", ordering an apple martini. So now I think any of you guys that like are closet apple martini fans, you can actually drink apple martini and be OK with it now. You can say Jalen Rose does it, so it's cool. Um, so anyway, so back to John Starks. John Starks is, goes through this kind of transformation that I'm sure many of you guys have seen your friends go through at a casino, where they start as this normal, intelligent human being, and then all of a sudden, after five or six hours, become this drunk, degenerate gambler. And that's what happened to poor John. So John takes his last $500 chip out, puts it down on the betting circle, and the dealer deals him an 11, and the dealer has a six up. So all you guys that play blackjack, what do you do there? Double. Double down, right? Which means he needs to put another $500 chip down, but unfortunately, poor John doesn't have one. So I flip him a $500 chip for my stack, and I say, pay me back when you win. The dealer gives him a five to make 16, and John looks at me and goes, man, you just jinxed me. I said, it's OK, John, because I'm counting cards, so I know that there's still a pretty good chance the dealer's going to bust. I think you'll still win. The dealer gives him a, a, the dealer flips a 10 to make 16, and then gets another 10 to make 26. Uh, bust. There's much rejoicing. John pushes me back my $500 chip, not a word of thank you. And at that moment, I decided that I would never have John Starks on my fantasy basketball team. <laughs> I really showed him. So I like to talk about, and, and this is from the first chapter of my, of my new book, the most important lesson I ever have learned at the Black Tech table. And it comes from Caesar's Palace. I was 22 years old. I walk up to the table, and I'm using math, again, to, to basically, I'll explain this all later, and most of you guys probably understand the concept. But I'm using math to beat the casino. So every decision I make is governed by math. It's completely 100% objective. So I walk up, and I bet two hands at $10,000. On the first hand, I get an 11. On the second hand, I get a pair of nines. And the dealer has a six up. So what do we do? An 11 against a 6, we double down again. So I put another $10,000 down, and I get a 7 on that to make 18. Then I split the 9s, OK? And I get a 2 on the first one. So I got to double again. Put another $10,000 down, and I do. OK, and then um, on the last 9, and I get, I think, an 8 on that to make 19. And on the last uh, 9, I get a 10 to make 19. So how much money do I have on the table? $50,000. OK, the dealer flips a, has a 6, flips a 5 to make 11, and then gets a 10 to make 21. And I lose $50,000. And this woman behind me shrieks, oh my god, that's my entire mortgage. And I want to turn around and go, well, where the hell do you live? Because we don't live in a place where there's $50,000 mortgages unless you're in a cardboard box in the tenderloin. But <clears throat> again, very focused on the math, very focused on objective data to make decisions. So now the objective data uh, tells me to bet three hands at $10,000. So I do. And I get a nine on the first hand, a 19 on the second, and an ace four on the third hand, and the dealer has a five up. OK, now again, basic strategy, as you know, Cliff mentioned, is this well played out, well simulated um, matrix of decisions that tells you what to do in every situation. And there's no, there's, no object, there's no subjectivity in playing blackjack. It's really funny because I'll stand behind my friends now because I'm not allowed to play blackjack. And they're all pretty smart friends. You know, and we'll be sitting there having a beer. And I'll be like the old guys from the Muppets just making fun of them when they play blackjack. But they'll turn around and they'll ask me. They'll be like, hey, I've got this hand. I've got this against this. And the dealer has that. What should I do? And I'll tell them. And they'll go, eh, I don't know. And they'll go and do their own thing, and they'll lose, right? And then I'll look at them and go, why do you bother asking me for advice if you're not going to listen? So nine against a five, right, you double. All right, so I put another $10,000 down. An ace four against a five is another doubling hand, so I have to put another $10,000 down. I do. I get a four on that to make 19, and the dealer has a five up. So here I am with my chance to win back that $50,000 or to lose two of the woman behind me's houses. So again, one of those moments where you kind of say, how in the world did I get here? Well, I was, if this advances, I can tell you what I was. I was a uh, graduated from MIT in 1994 with a mechanical engineering major, which I've used nothing of in my life. 
and then did this like incredible rebellion against the world of engineering, and instead of going to medical school, went into the world of finance. In the interim, this whole internet thing started, and these days people don't depict the internet this way, but it used to be depicted always as this big cloud, and that's what the internet looks like in case you were wondering. And then I went on to start three companies, the last of which um, was called Citizen Sports, and just sold that to Yahoo actually three, three months ago and decided I, I didn't want to work there as part of the deal, so I am now just out promoting my book. But uh, during that whole time, I was a, a professional card counter, um, and uh, I played blackjack for a living. And I like to actually make this reference to the guy who invented the internet, which is important that we all refer to him, because now we can say that Al Gore has invented two things, one good, one bad. He invented the internet, which is good. None of us would have jobs if he hadn't done that. And then he invented global warming, which has been bad for us. So. Come on, that's funny. No one ever laughs at that joke anymore. I think that joke is too far for people now. They don't remember that. Anyways. Okay, so wh what, what is a professional blackjack player? The first thing people will say is, isn't that illegal? And it's actually been tried, and, and I have a whole passage in the book, because people always wonder why it isn't illegal or why, you know. It's just using your brain to beat a game. It's like, what's your name? Mike. Mike? It's like Mike and I are playing Monopoly together all the time. And I always buy Boardwalk and Park Place, and he buys the crappy utilities, and one day he just throws the board up in the air and says, this should be illegal. It's just using your brain to beat a game, to be better than someone at a game. So Mike, just get better at Monopoly and stop complaining. So um, the second thing that people always say is, are you banned from Vegas? And believe it or not, there's not someone who waits for me at the jetway at McCarran Airport when I get off and says, excuse me, Mr. Ma, you have to turn around and go home. I'm just not allowed to play blackjack. Actually, a pretty funny story from the filming of the movie. Now, you guys that have seen the movie know I'm in the movie, right? Nod, pretend you remember. <laughs> Otherwise, it's really sad for me. <laughs> yes, okay, so this is always very sad for me because people never remember. I am a dealer in the movie named Jeffrey. The person who plays me walks up to me and says, Jeffrey, my brother from another, I have a couple witty lines, a SAG card, nominated for a new Academy Award, best actor in a movie that's about themselves that's in the movie for less than five minutes. But that scene, which is literally about five minutes long, uh, I was out there filming for three days. And it's not because I was messing up my line, it's because you talk about an inefficient industry, movie making is completely inefficient. So I'm out there filming my scene, and one day the cast turns to me and they go, hey Jeff, I think it'd be really fun if we all uh, go to dinner tonight. So we go and we head to dinner, on the way over to dinner, Kate Bosworth pulls me aside. And any of you guys know what Kate Bosworth looks like? When she pulls you aside, you're like, Kate, yes, what would you want? What can I do for you? So Kate says to me, she says, you know what I think would be really fun? And I said, what? And she said, after dinner, let's all go play blackjack. And I said, Kate, um, I don't even think this is going to happen. They know who I am. Uh, they're not going to let me play blackjack. She said, it's OK. You'll be with me. I'm a big star. They won't bother you. And I'm like, Kate. It's been a long time since Blue Crush. I don't know what a big star you are anymore. <laughs> but what seemed like this horrible idea, after about four or five bottles of wine later, seemed like this great idea. And after dinner, we're rolling upstairs to the uh, casino at the top of the Palms, the Playboy Casino. And I sit down at the table. And the floor person looks at me and goes, Jeff, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm here. I'm playing blackjack with Kate Bosworth, Blue Crush, big star, no big deal, right? And he said, uh, let me check. And he calls upstairs and comes back to the table. And he goes, not only are you not allowed to play, but if your little friend Kate's at the table, you're not allowed to be within 20 feet of the table. And so this was cool because it made Kate think I was like this, you know, she thought I was so cool after that. And so she went and told everyone on set the next day how cool I was. And uh, if any of you guys watched uh, Seinfeld, it's like when George tries to be a bootlegger and like he's this really bad dude. Anyways. Sorry, sorry for the non sequitur. But the whole point is I'm not banned from Vegas, they just don't let me play blackjack. And then the final thing is they say, remind me never to play poker with you. And this is interesting because it actually is a real, it, it really kind of is a lead into why I wrote The House Advantage, my new book. Because blackjack is this perfect petri dish for using analytics. Imagine that you could model situations and always know how the person you were modeling or playing against was gonna act. You always knew perfectly. In poker, you don't, right? Poker, you can make absolutely the right call all the time, and then some idiot decides to you know, go all in on a pair of twos, and you know, you just, you know, two pops up, and they get lucky, and you lose. And the same thing's true of the market, right? You know, people think 
that it's smart to keep lending, you know, a million dollar mortgage to farm workers who make twelve thousand dollars a year and think that's a good investment decision from a mortgage standpoint. I mean, people act irrational, and um, blackjack is not that way because you only play against the dealer, and you know at all times how the dealer is going to act, so you can model the situa per situation perfectly. So what makes blackjack beatable? Well, blackjack is the only game in the casino that's subject to something called conditional probability. If you contrast blackjack to roulette, and one of my favorite stories from roulette, and it's in the house advantage, is this time that I went to Vegas with my friend Brian. And this is after the whole blackjack thing was done for me. And I walked up to the, um, the blackjack table, and Brian actually asked me to sort of coach him to play blackjack. So I kind of sitting next to him and just telling him what to do. And over about two hours, we won a couple thousand dollars. So it's Friday night in Vegas. I'm like, let's go spend the money somewhere. So we get up, and we start walking over to, to go cash out the chips. And all of a sudden, Brian disappears. I'm like, where did Brian go? And all of a sudden, I hear, thousand dollars on black. <laughs> I look up, there's Brian. I walk over to the roulette table, and Brian's sitting there. And the, before I can say anything, the roulette wheel spins, and it's 14 red. Brian loses $1,000. I go to grab Brian, and you know I'm pretty happy that he's only lost $1,000, and he's still up 1000 And I can explain to him you know, that roulette is the ho most horrible game you can play in the casino. And he looks at me, and before I can grab him, he, I hear him say, $1,000 on black. And I say, Brian, what are you doing? And he says, don't you see what's happening here? And I said, no. And he points up to this magical sign above the roulette wheel. And this magical sign has the result of the last 20 spins. And the last seven now have been red. So in Brian's mind, black is a sure thing. And I say, Brian, that's not true. And he goes, listen, I know you know blackjack and statistics, but this is roulette, and this is gambling, and I know gambling. <laughs> well, we all know that the flaw in his logic, right? Every spin of that roulette wheel is independent. And I walked away, and the whole fool and his money are soon parted. Well, he was the fool, and his money parted. And uh, you know, an improbable three more reds in a row, Brian was out $4,000 now and down 2000 for the night. And we no longer had any money to spend at the club, but no, no worries. Anyways, so the, the point is that roulette, every spin is independent. And the same thing is true of craps, right? Every roll of the dice is independent. But in blackjack, if I take all four aces out of a deck of cards, hand you that deck of cards, what do you think the chance of you dealing yourself blackjack are? Mike, what do you think the chances are? Zero, right? There's no more aces left. Good luck dealing yourself blackjack with no aces in the deck, right? So blackjack is, is the only game where what you see impacts what you're going to see. Uh, there's a professor and by the name of Ed Thorpe, and he wrote a book called Beat the Dealer. But in, in, the, in the early days, okay, and this is in the 1960s, Ed Thorpe was a grad student at UCLA. And he, um, his wife wanted to go on a vacation. So he had this idea of going on a vacation with his wife to Vegas. And you know the thing with really smart odds people is they don't want to gamble because they know the odds are always against them. So Ed Thorpe did not want to gamble in Vegas. He just wanted to take advantage of the buffets and the pool and the shows. And so he's like thinking about heading to Vegas and not gambling. And then all of a sudden, before he goes, this guy hands him a research paper that had just been done by these army technicians where they uh, used handheld calculators. Because remember, this is in the 1960s. It's not like people are floating around with laptops back then. And this, 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 this thing basically told him, this paper told him that there was an optimal strategy for blackjack, which is this basic strategy thing that I've already alluded to. And what it, what it said was that if you did this correctly, your odds against the casino were about even. So he took this little piece of paper, and he walked into the casino, and he sat down at the table. And this is a guy, Ed Thorpe, that wrote Beat the Dealer. He then wrote a book called Beat the Market. He started the first quantitative hedge fund, has made hundreds of millions of dollars. But he tells this story to me like it's his proudest moment. He goes, Jeff, I started with $10 at that table. And you know how much I walked away with? And I'm like, I don't know, like 100000 10000 He's like, $1.50. And I'm like, really? And he's like, but I outlasted everyone at that table, and they all thought it was crazy. <laughs> so this was the moment that he realized that blackjack might indeed be beatable. And so what he did is he took this knowledge with him to MIT, and he applied it, and he had one of the first computers ever, an IBM 704 computer, and actually did simulations on blackjack where he simulated a deck of cards with no twos in it, with no threes, with no fours. And what he found is that 
the high cards, tens, face cards, and aces, are valuable for the player, meaning when there's a lot of those left, it's good for the player. The low cards, two, three, four, fives, and six, are bad for the player. So when those are gone, that's good for the player. Okay? And then we just created, and he created this really simple way of tracking the cards and by lumping them into these buckets. And so what this does is this tells you what your odds of winning are. You know, when, you're, uh, when there's a lot of tens left, your odds of winning go up, and that means you bet more. When your odds of winning uh, go down, you bet less or you don't play at all. And this is really this sort of fundamental lesson of blackjack. And this is why, why I say, how is Google like card counting, right? And, and the reason is, is that Google, in a lot of ways, is all about data. And it's all, I mean, I don't, you guys tell me what Google's really about. But when I look at Google from the outside, I think a lot of it's about data. And it's a lot about is using the past to predict the future, right? The better algorithms and whatnot. And that's really what card counting was. This quote from this French philosopher, sort of in poet, the history teaches us everything, including the future, is the key to card counting. It's using data from the past to predict the future. And so many industries would be you know, well served to think about business that way right now. And that's at the core of sort of why, why I wanted to write the book. Um, so when you, when you have at the core this sort of idea of using data and analytics behind you, it helps you make difficult decisions. Okay, so prove to you guys I was actually in the movie. That's me, Jeffrey the dealer. What's sad about this is I had a name tag as a prop and they actually spelled my name wrong. So I'm not Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, the dealer. I'm Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y. But anyway, so um, why I have this up here is to remind myself and you guys of one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made. Okay, and how many of you guys play blackjack? So only about half of you guys. So you're not, this will be, this will be a little bit difficult for you guys to understand, but I walk up to a table and this is uh, probably about a year and a half into my playing, and I had just learned something called numbers plays, which is an advanced way, it's almost like an advanced strategy. It's a way of actually varying what you do at the table based on knowledge of how many tens and low cards are left. So I walked up to the table, and the count, you know, my teammates basically, the whole idea of the cloak and dagger thing where Kate Bosworth folds her arms, and well, I walk up to the table, and uh, the math tells me to bet two hands of $8,000. So I do. I bet two hands at 8,000, and the first one I get blackjack, and then the second one I get a pair of 10s, and the dealer has a six up. So the blackjack, I get paid $12,000. Okay, great, all rejoicing. The pair of 10s, I actually have the opportunity to split, but no one in their right mind splits 10s with $50 on the table, let alone $8,000. But actually, the math called for me to split these. And let me explain to you the math behind it. Imagine you're tracking 10s, and low cards. And imagine that you know that pretty much every card you're not seeing is a 10. And if you have a pair of 10s against a 6, wouldn't you want to split those? Wouldn't that give you a higher expected value? So that's what I did. So I turned to the floor, the woman, and she's like looking at me like, I'm crazy. I said, I, I think I want to split those. And she's like, excuse me, you want to what? I said, I think I want to split those. And literally, there's four people at the table all stare up at me. And if they were packing heat, I would have been dead right then. But the dealer gives me a 9 to make 19 and then gets an ace, and then gives me an ace on the second one to give me 21. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself, but I still need the dealer to bust, otherwise probably won't walk away from the table alive. The dealer flips a 10 to make 16, and he gets a 10 to make 26. I win. I grab my chips and I run away from the table, basically, because I knew that they were going to be pissed off at me. But as I walked away from the table, I thought a lot about why that was such a hard decision for me. And there's a lot of reasons why that was hard for me. And if you think about them in terms of business stance, it's one of the reasons why it's so hard to make difficult decisions in general. One was something called groupthink, okay? So many of the decisions that you make in life are influenced by people around you, and they don't need to be. Everyone at that table did, thought I was an idiot for splitting those tens, right? There, there's, to a man, they thought I was idiots. And this was a $500 table. So they all had real money out there and all probably thought they knew a lot about blackjack. But I had to like, divorce myself from the, you know, from the feelings of wanting to just assuage them you know, and just go with it and split them. The second thing is actually a, a cognitive bias. Are you guys familiar with uh, uh, any sort of behavioral economics or behavioral finance stuff that's done? Any of you guys read Dan Ariely's work in Predictably Irrational? 
the, the classic way of looking at economics is that people are rational. People always make the right decision. But the reality is people aren't. And in fact, there's something called loss aversion, where we're more impacted by a loss than we are by a gain of equal amounts. It's the reason why when Google stock was shooting up you know, back in the day, that people kept, every time you guys kept kicking butt, they'd still sell because they were afraid of losing the money that they had gained already. It would go up more, and they'd be, they'd be really pissed off that they sold. In general, it's the reason why people are risk averse. It's something called loss aversion. And for me, having that 20, and when people have 20, they already bank that as a win, and they don't want to give up the opportunity to make more money. But if you think about the way that, and not, not to talk about, I don't know, do you guys consider, I guess you consider Facebook a competitor for sure now, maybe? I don't know. Anyways, I was speaking of Facebook, and, and I, I mentioned the story, and I said, you guys, are you going to take the exact same risk now and I spoke at the, that day, the day that they had 500 million, they got into the 500 million users. Are you gonna take the same risk today? And someone from the executive team was standing in the back, and he said, absolutely, we're gonna take the same risks. Because they're not loss averse, and I'm sure you guys are not loss averse as a company. You're thinking about how do we continue to grow the business, not how do we try to protect and defend. The, the other kind of bias that actually comes into place is something called omission bias, or in, in, inactivity bias. And so in Blackjack, what's interesting is, is People make mistakes, so many mistakes when they play blackjack. And they make a lot of mistakes based on inactivity versus activity. So think about it. You have uh, 15 and the dealer has a 10 up. What do you guys do in that situation? You hit, right? Because there's a good chance they got 20. But a lot of people will stand on that because 15, they're worried that they're going to get a 7, an 8, a 9, a 10, and bust, right? And that's something called omission bias. People favor maintaining status quo versus making an active decision. I always kind of allude this to, like, to take it totally out of the realm of business and out of, out of sports or out of gambling, to that friend of yours that you know is in this horrible relationship, and, ev and then they, they, every day they, don't, they stay in that relationship, right, because they just don't want to make the active decision of breaking up with them because the idea of staying in this relationship is easier, right? Maintaining status quo is easier. So when you think about making decisions, as we did in Blackjack, you have to think about inactivity and activity equally. Okay. So as I thought about this whole thing, I was reminded, how many of you guys are sports fans? All right, so a handful of you again. There was a guy by the name of Bill Belichick who made this really difficult decision for, with the New England Patriots. He got sort of killed about it. Anyways, at the end of the day, it was an okay decision, but it didn't work. And I was talking to a very famous sports writer by the name of Bill Simmons about it. And Bill and I were talking about the decision, and he was getting frustrated with me because I thought I was right, and he thought he was right. In the end, he looks at me and he goes, well, Jeff, you know what? It was the wrong decision. We know that. And I said, how do we know that, Bill? And he said, because it didn't work. But you guys laugh, but I mean, in his mind, bad outcome meant bad decision. And that's not true, right? A bad decision doesn't always necessarily mean a bad outcome. And separating the outcome for the decision was an important thing that we learned in Blackjack. You can make the right decision all the time, but still lose if you just happen to get unlucky and the dealer got a five to make 21. So why make difficult decisions? You don't want to end up like this guy. You want to end up like this guy instead. Okay, and, and Sean Payton. What's interesting about Sean Payton, now how many of you guys watched the Super Bowl? Okay. So you guys all know the really, really crazy thing Sean Payton did, right? He decided to go for an onside kick at the beginning of the second half. Okay, and for those of you guys that don't follow football, onside kick is this really risky thing. You basically kick the ball short, and if your team's able to recover it, you get the ball. But if not, you're, the other team gets the ball in much better field position. And this is a really risky thing because over the course of you know, history of football, only 25% of onside kicks are recovered by the, home t by the team kicking it. But what no one in mainstream media, no one talked about, was that a surprise onside kick, which this was, is recovered 60% of the time by the kicking team. So even though this was a, like a big risk by Sean Payton, if he had done this 1,000 times, his team would have gotten the ball 600. So how risky was it really? So what's kind of interesting about this whole Sean Payton and Bill Belichick thing, just to get out of sports now, is actually highlights sort of this, this thing. That, now, the reason that we use analytics and the reason that I've used analytics and, is, that I, is that I believe it helps you win more often. And teams help, it help, it's just makes your, your company win, makes your team win. But what, what's interesting about coaches 
in professional teams. And I was talking to Daryl Morey, who's the general manager of the Houston Rockets about this. And I was kind of like bitching to him about how, you know, coaches make all these bad decisions. Why do they do this? They make decisions that don't help them ultimately win. And he said, you know what? Because their ultimate goal is not necessarily to win. And I said, really? How is that possible? And he said, actually, their first goal is self-preservation. They want to keep their job. And if they do something that is so, there's a, there's a philosopher, or sorry, economist named John Maynard Keynes. And he has this great quote that says, you know, history would teach us that it's better to fail, uncon uh, fail conventionally than it is to succeed unconventionally. And just this idea that you need to sort of go with the flow, and that's what these coaches were doing. So it's what I think, it, and there's, a, there's actually a chapter in the book. How many of you guys, has anyone read The House Advantage yet? So there's a, there's a chapter in there that actually talks a little bit about Google. And it talks about Tom Wu, who anyone of you guys know Tom Wu. He's in your sort of uh, HR compensation plan department. And he talked a lot about the way that you guys work hard to try to create aligned incentives within your compensation programs. And that's like what people need to do. Because in, in Blackjack, we had a really, really great si set of aligned incentives. We had this pile of cash and chips that we tried to grow into a bigger pile of cash and chips. Okay, and that's how simple it was. Actually, people always ask me, what was the most money you ever made in a weekend? And the most money we ever made in a weekend was $450,000. And at the end of the weekend, myself and, a couple, and one of my other buddies, Wes, were sitting at the Mirage Pool with all the money that we had in a duffel bag. <clears throat> and the reason we do that is because we didn't want to leave the bag up in our room, and it was too big to put in the safe. So we have it down at the pool under a lawn chair in this ratty duffel bag. No one knows what's in it. So I turn to Wes and I say, Wes, do you think we can just leave this bag here and maybe go for a swim? And he looks at me and he goes, uh, well, how much is in there? And I said, well, it's the money we won, $450,000, and the money we brought out here, $540,000. So it's about $990,000. And he goes, I don't see why we can't leave it. It's not like it's a million dollars. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had this sort of real common you know, set of incentives. And I think that in business, that's so important. You know, if you read Michael Lewis's new book, The Big Short, what he talks all about is how the mortgage crisis, so much of it was caused by people having misaligned incentives. And I applaud the work that you guys do on your compensation plans for trying to strive so much for aligned incentives. So, okay, my four keys to making better decisions, and this is sort of a recap of what we just talked about. One, that re realized decisions are everywhere. This idea of omission bias or you know, not wanting to make a decision, that should be the same weight as actually making the decision. Uh, evaluate decisions from a true zero frame of reference. So this will help you avoid that idea of loss aversion, right? Instead of thinking about like, okay, I've, I've already won $5,000, maybe I'll just kind of quit right now. Well, no, your company will never get bigger if you think that way. Oops. Imagine you were to make a decision millions of times. So in the Sean Payton example that we talked about, you know, instead of him thinking about that one play, think about, well, if I did this a thousand times, how many times it would work? You need to, like, let's say that Mike, I know you're sitting in the front row, just shouldn't have done it. So let's say we're gonna play a game, you and I, all right? We'll flip a coin. If it's heads, okay, I'm gonna give you a million dollars. If it's tails, you give me a hundred thousand dollars, okay? Right, you're psyched on that. But, but let, me, let me preempt, let, I got a, five goons behind me. And if you lose, you gotta pay me right now. They're gonna go with you to whatever bank you're at, whatever place you're at, and you gotta pull that $100,000 out and hand it to me today. Otherwise, they're gonna rough you up. But you only get to play once. Do you wanna play that game still? Okay, now let me say that you have a line of credit with me. And you can play that game as many times as you want, and you can settle whenever you want. Now do you wanna play that game? Absolutely, right? And so the decision is much easier when you get to make it millions of times than it is to do it just once. So try to think about decisions and try to put yourself into positions where you get to make good decisions millions of times. And the final thing is this idea, this Bill Simmons story, right? Don't confuse the outcome with the decision. A bad outcome does not necessarily mean a bad decision. And that's the best way to think about as you evaluate decisions you make in your life or in your business, whether they're good or not. Right? Don't think about, okay, it just worked. This guy was telling me he works for a hedge fund, right? And he says his hedge fund manager, the guy that he works for, does not believe in this, right? He believes that good decision, good outcome always means good decision. He was telling this story, actually, what's funny, where he was trying to buy Google, I think. 
and he mistyped the ticker symbol and didn't notice and bought some other stock that went up 60% in like two days and claimed that that was a good decision because it was a good outcome, as crazy as that sounds. So let's go back to my defining moment, my big lesson. Oh, this slide just gets all screwed up now. I gotta fix it. Anyways, this kind of gave it away. But basically I had, recap, I had $50,000 on the table. Okay, the dealer had a five up. I'm about to win back this money, this woman's house that she lost on my mortgage. The dealer flips a 10 to make 15 and then gets a six to make 21. And I remember thinking to myself, well, well, first of all, I was 22 years old, just lost $100,000, sick to my stomach. I walk upstairs to my room at Caesar's Palace, collapse on the floor, stare up at the ceiling, wonder to myself, why is there a mirror up there? And then once I got over that, <laughs> I was 22, no idea why there's a mirror. So once I got over that, I'm like, do people get ready like this? How do they do this? So once I got over that, I started thinking about all those lessons that I had just talked about, right? I thought about loss aversion. I thought about the idea of making a decision a million times. I thought about, did, had I made the right decision and just suffered a bad outcome? And I realized that that, that that was true. You know, and I thought about all this that I believed in, in terms of numbers and analytics and math, and I really believed that I had made the right decision. So I went back down and I kept playing. And for the weekend, I won back that $100,000 I lost, and I won an additional $70,000. So I ended up plus $70,000 for the weekend. And you know, if I had quit, a lot of this would never have happened to me. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be considered this you know, data expert, and I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I never would have had a movie or a book written about me, and I wouldn't have been able to write my new book, The House Advantage. So thanks for the time. Do we have questions? I'm going to put my mic up here now so people can get the mic, and then I'm going to stand by the podium. Uh. So when you talk about decision making in blackjack, um, from an objective point of view, you have the numbers and there's always a right decision, right? Mm -hmm. But in business and um, in poker, for example, you have the incomplete set of yeah. information, right? And a lot of times, like you know, like you said, you lose your hundred thousand dollars here, but to you, you can rationalize it to yourself that oh, you made the right decision mathematically. But in business and in poker, a lot of times you think you made the right decision but you right. don't actually know. Right. So how do you deal with that kind of uncertainty? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think you need, to, you need to be able to do things enough times that you can decide whether it was the right decision or not. So I think that's a really good point, which is ultimately how do you avoid having like confirmation bias where you look back on something and you go, God, I think that was the right decision. So in Blackjack, if you think about it, we had this played out and simulated so many times that we knew it was the right decision. So you have to create a framework that you're certain that your decisions are correct and not just rely on outcomes. That makes sense? Yeah. And I mean, the thing with poker and the market and everything is that you're never going to be able to uh, reach the certainty that we did in Blackjack. Mm -hmm. You're going to just try to improve. So all you want to do is make sure that whatever analytics or whatever framework you're using improves your ability to make decisions. So that's the only level that you need to feel confident. And then honestly, if you do something a million times, if you do something a hundred times and it keeps not working, or a thousand times and it keeps not working, it probably wasn't a good decision in the first place. Yeah. So. You have to be pretty objective with yourself, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again for, for coming out no and problem. speaking to us. I just wanted to, to ask you, now that the, uh, the houses at a lot of these casinos have gotten a lot smarter and started to add more decks to the shoes, it, do you think it's still possible to, to, to beat the house? Or um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot harder in Blackjack, and certainly, like, our movie, our book, and this book don't really help. Um, but, you know, it, it's... Um, the thing about the casinos is that the, the, the reason that blackjack is beatable and the reason that blackjack became popular was because it was um, a game that could be beaten. So it's always going to be beatable because that's what makes it popular, and they're always going to offer a version of it that's beatable. It's just harder to beat than, than it used to be. You just have to find your niche. We, you can't do like a, a big team anymore with hundreds of thousands of dollars. You could probably go in as an individual betting thousands of dollars and be OK. Other questions? Anyone? Come on, you guys must have some questions. Don't you want to know if I ever really got beat up? Yeah. Don't you know if it was like, how was having a white guy play me? I mean, these are all the standard <laughs> questions. Like, I can start asking them myself. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so 
uh, you talked a little bit <clears throat> about uh, having an argument with uh, Bill Simmons about mm -hmm. um, a football decision. Mm -hmm. What exactly was the decision? What were the what was the frame of reference uh, that you were well, using versus was, the way so that he in was the talking? it was the um, when the Patriots went for it on fourth and two against the Colts, and they were at their own twenty nine yard line. They were up by six points, and they didn't get it. And then the Colts came down and scored and, and won the game. And he got killed, uh, Bill, Bill Belichick got killed by the mainstream media because they thought it was absolutely the wrong decision. Now, there was a lot of math and numbers that said that it, it, it was the right decision. And I'm not here to tell you guys it was the right decision or wrong decision. What I'm saying is that it was a, a probably a, a difficult decision that he probably could have been right. What I'm here to say is that it didn't make it a bad decision because it didn't work, right? That, that's my main point. So you mentioned that uh, people get mad at the blackjack table when you pull cards when you're not supposed to. Yeah. Is there anything beyond superstitious to that? No. It's like, how do you explain to people that it really doesn't there's a, matter? There's like this wonderful chapter in this new book called The House Advantage about it. Um, no, that I do, I do talk about that. And, and that's, so what he's referencing is that in blackjack, you only play against the dealer. OK, you don't play against the other players. Yet, when you do something that people perceive to be wrong, and it causes, let's say that you have a, a 12, and the dealer has a six up, and you decide to hit your hand, and you get a 10, right? And you bust, and the dealer flips his card, has 16, and gets a five, and makes 21, and everyone loses, right? The, the thought process is that you took the 10 that was going to keep the dealer from busting, so you cost the entire table. But the problem with that is that the cards are in there 100% completely randomly. And you very well could have taken the six that the dealer needed to, or the five that the dealer needed to make 21, and then ended up giving the dealer 10. Now, nobody ever remembers the times that people did things, and it hurt them, and it helped them, right? People only remember the things, the times that people did things, and it hurt them. And that's something called confirmation bias, right? We're all inclined to believe things that support our hypothesis, right? It's just easier. It's like the reason that there's conspiracy theories. There was a whole, there's going to be this whole section of my book where I made fun of Charlie Sheen, because Charlie Sheen actually still believes, or, and you just go, and it's cool to say at Google, just go home and Google this. I have to say that's cool. Sorry, that was just <laughs> nerdy. But go back and Google this, which is to say that Charlie Sheen, conspiracy theory, and you'll see quotes from him where he says, it looked too planned the way that second tower went down, almost like it was an internal demolition. Or he says things like, they never found any plane parts at the Pentagon, even though they did find plane parts at the Pentagon. So you know, the, 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 the concept is that he has this conspiracy theory, and he only wants to remember details that support his conspiracy theory. And that's true of, of people that, that believe that, right? And what I would say to them is, listen, what I want you to do for the next year, you're playing blackjack. I want you to take on your you know, iPhone or whatever. I want you to keep running track of every time someone does something stupid and it hurts you, and every time someone does something stupid and it helps you. And I bet after that year, you're going to come back and it's going to be 50 50. So that's what I would tell them. How often do they do that? No one will do that. <laughs> but confirmation bias is fascinating because it, it, it's not just the blackjack table, it affects us all over the world, right? <laughs> it's the reason why, you know, like the, there's this guy I mentioned earlier, Daryl Morey, he's a, you know, the general manager of the Houston Rockets. And he's like telling me about how important it is that he will only have people that work for him that are willing to argue with him. Because he doesn't want to have people that are there just confirming whatever biases he has. It's important. Yeah. Um, oh, also, FYI, I think actually Bill Simmons, if, I don't know if you read the article about you know, that Bill Belichick incident afterwards, but I think he ended up agreeing with you afterwards, so. He's, he's, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to talk yeah. about Bill Simmons anymore. <laughs> he's already gotten enough play on this. Yeah, uh, anyways, yeah. So there's this thing that, um, I guess in poker we call it emotional tilt, right? right? It's a situation where, right. you know, you understand, right. where you, right. yeah, like you make a right decision, <clears throat> but you get the wrong result. And you get this like kind of huge like blow to right. your, to your, you know, head where it's like, God, like, what the hell is There's that? There's, like, right? emotional tilt in business. There's, it's right. in everything, right? Yeah, so, the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, like, you know, beyond kind of trying to stay objective, beyond looking at the numbers, beyond that, like, what do you think is, like, a real, like, tangible way you can deal with that? <clears throat> you can't make emotional decisions if you really want to be successful. I mean, there's not a lot of people that make emotional decisions that are successful. And, the, you know, avoiding 
emotional tilt in life and in business and blackjack or poker is really important. And that's one of the things that using data and analytics to make decisions, it makes it easier for you to make unemotional decisions because you're not impacted by what recently happened because you're not following a subjective framework, you're following an objective framework. And I, 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 think, that's, I think that's really important because there's a scene in, in the movie 21 where the guy that plays me basically goes on emotional tilt and he loses hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that scene is based on the story that I told you guys where I lost $100,000 in two hands of blackjack. And when I read that script the first time, I went to the screenwriter and I said, you gotta take this out because we would never have done this. If someone went on an emotional tilt, they were fired. They were off our team. So of course they don't listen to me because they're making a Hollywood movie. But the point is that that's just unacceptable. You can't allow that to happen. You got someone behind you. Um, to sort of follow up on that question, what are the um, what are the elements that cause people to go into that emotional tilt, like on a casino floor or in a trading room? That's a fascinating. Know, a really that's a fascinating, and, and honestly, that's something that I've been sort of playing around with for my next book, if I do a next book, which is just this idea of of the emotions that go behind us that make us make really bad decisions. So, like, there are a lot of really really successful people in business that go to Vegas and play games that they know they're going to lose, but they still do it. And I don't know why they do it. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I honestly don't know. I would love, it's a fascinating thing to think about. Because if you could understand that, you could, one, help people make better decisions, and two, you could prey on that for your own business to help them <laughs> make bad decisions. So, okay, cool. Did you have something in the back, the red shirt? or? So, um, Question on, I think someone asked earlier about when you have incomplete information and, and you know that you don't have enough information right. to, or all the information. Right. To, and I guess recently there's, I mean, there's been some books or articles about like your gut instinct and how that right. could be right because you're assimilating information that you don't logically have, but you have. Right. What, do you, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a chapter in my book that's entitled The Brain Cells in Your Stomach, and it's, it's it's supposed to be talking about gut or intuition, or it's supposed to kind of d describe this new form of intuition, which is kind of like what you're saying, this idea that, you know, that, that maybe your intuition is incorporating data that you're not conscious of, um, which is fine, which is like a great way of, of thinking about things. But I think the key is that you understand that every successful decision that's made has some form of data behind it. It might not be data sitting in a spreadsheet. It might be in your brain. And it might be, not even be totally data that you remember or understand, but it's data nonetheless. Because like the point of that chapter that I have is, is the last time I checked, there's no brain cells in your stomach, right? Because you know, and you can't use your gut to actually make a decision. Um, and I'm actually like literally, I have in my bag um, a, cop a copy of Blink, Malcolm Gladwell's book, because I want to reread it. Because it, it, when I remember reading it, it kind of drives me crazy, right? This idea that you know people blink and they make these great decisions. Well, that's well and good, but how in the world are we able to harness that or use that in our lives? And I'd love to take him to task on that and try to get him to help me understand how that's useful to me. So. OK, so did you really get beaten up? And how bad did it get? And uh, also, did you start the club at MIT, or was it already no, there? No, it, it's been around for a long time. You know, it's, it's one of those things that the reason that I got um, you know, well known is because I approached Ben Meserich, who wrote Bring Down the House, the original book. And I told him I had this great story for him. He was, um, uh, had written only fictional books before. And some would say he's only written fictional books since. Um, that, that's a little inside joke about Ben and the flack he's getting on his Facebook book. Uh, but he'd written six books before, and they're all fictional. And I had this great you know, story about what we did playing blackjack. Now, none of it, neither of us thought the book was going to be big at all. And what's actually interesting is that like in terms of like the life is about preparation and, and luck and you know hopefully success is, comes from those two things. Well, this was a lot of luck. It turned out that Kevin Spacey's right-hand man read a wired adaptation um, version of the book before it even came out and called Ben and, and told him, I really think we, that Kevin and I want to make this into a movie. So before the book even came out, it was going to be made in a movie by Kevin Spacey. And Ben was on the Today Show the first day the book came out. It went through the roof on Amazon, all this kind of stuff. Anyways, so that's how I ended up getting well known in that in that equation. It wasn't because I started the team. Um, I never really got beat up. There's a there's a scene that I describe in, in the new book about getting ch chased off a riverboat in Shreveport, Louisiana, at gunpoint, wondering to myself if anyone's going to notice if an Asian dude disappears in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, 
and uh, you know it was a uh, it was it was a sort of fascinating time. The, the the scariest thing probably that ever happened to me was when I was screening the movie for the first time. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne was sitting right next to me in this like tiny little screening room, and every time his character hit my character, he would stand up and cackle over me, and I was just like, "Leave me alone, Morpheus. Go back to the go back to the Matrix." Um, yeah. <clears throat> so so did it in fact upset you to be portrayed as a white guy? You know what? Um, <laughs> It, it, it didn't. It did and it didn't. Now, if any of you guys actually think that I had any say in who cast me, you're crazy. Because it's not like I'm Lance Armstrong, you know, where people are going to go, okay, I know Lance Armstrong is not black. You know? <laughs> they, they, they're not going to know that. So I didn't really have a lot of say. And at the end of the day, what I tried to do was be as complicit with the casino, with the, sorry, with the studio as possible so that they would make me part of their promotion. And they did. They made me front and center for their promotion. I was you know, on the second front page of USA Today. I was on the early show on CBS. And that was my way of sort of representing to everyone that the guy from Bring Down the House was Asian American. If I had gone against them, they would have pushed me totally out, and nobody would have ever known. They probably would have taken Ben Mezrick out with them on their PR tour. So you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty strong in my, you know, my roots. And it's not like I wanted to ever. And, and the reason I'm talking about this so much is because I did get a lot of flack about it publicly, um, it's not like I had that much say. And in the end, I tried to do the best thing for you know, myself and the movie and just my culture in general, I guess. All right, we could probably take one more, if anyone has one more. OK, if not, I'll, OK, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh. Real quick, sorry. No problem. So I know a lot of people have very, very strong opinions about LeBron James's decision to join yeah. the Heat. I just wanted to know, based on your thoughts on decision yeah. making, what do you think on his decision? <laughs> and part two, have you ever talked to Bill Simmons about that? I have not talked to Simmons about it. Um, Simmons is like, the reason I'm mad at Simmons is because I'm trying to, I talked to him about my book back in February. He thought it was like a great idea, said, oh, I'd like really be interested in reading that. And I've been trying to get him to read it, and I haven't been able to get him to read it yet. So I'm, that's why I'm annoyed, in full disclosure. <laughs> the second thing is that LeBron James, um, it, was a fascinating, it was a fascinating time. For, for two weeks, it was consuming so many people. And every, I was doing a, a, an interview with them, um, and not to like stereotype or, or prof, profile or anything, but with like a 65-year-old know, woman on NPR in Boston. And we started talking about the book, and then we mentioned sports, and he's just like, what do you think of LeBron James? And so all of a sudden, we got on LeBron James. Um, I think it was kind of a cowardly decision. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I kind of agree with Michael Jordan's words when he says, like, you're LeBron James. People come to you. You don't come to them. Um, and, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of ways you can paint it. I mean, he wanted to go play basketball with two of his friends who were really good. And who can fault him for that? In Miami versus Cleveland, who can fault him for that? <laughs> So, you know, okay, sorry. Do you think it was a good business decision? For him? I, don't, I just don't think it matters, right? He has so much money, like, what's the difference? I mean, you can play that out. Like, there's all those ideas. And I, I, I did about two different or three different interviews for this for different ESPN and sports outlets. You know, there's no income tax, state income tax in Miami. There's no, you know, th there's all these things, right? He's probably going to spend so much money in bottle service of the clubs that it probably was a bad <laughs> financial decision in South Beach. But, um, no, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea on that, so. Cool. Thanks. I just think when you're talking about the bias and how a lot of people say that if he doesn't win a ring, then it was a bad decision. But yeah, not necessarily. I don't think you can say that. <laughs> so. All right, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, that was an outstanding talk. Um, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks, guys. Thank